Okay. Um, Hold on one second. All right. So when we got together last week, I had mentioned some of the tools that I had used, but I just didn't demonstrate how I had used them. And so um, Jay thought maybe it'd be beneficial to go through and present uh, about three different types of uses I had for the masking tool. Now that's not definitely not all of that I use, but these were the three that came up as maybe being something to touch on tonight. And so I thought I would go over it. And the first picture we're gonna work on is this one. And I know it wasn't part of the program, but it, I can use it to demo it. So the one I had from Utah lives on a different disc than this one does. So it's, I just not gonna switch back and forth between the catalogs while we're doing this program. But um, anyway, so I'm going to take this one into the develop module. And here we go. So you can all see my picture, right? Okay. So the, the three different things that I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you invert and how to invert and some of the details around that one. And then I'll talk about luminosity masks and how you can um, combine masks to get exactly what you want. So to start with, I'm going to use this photo. <clears throat> excuse me, in order to demonstrate uh, the invert mask. So I'm gonna go over to my masking panel and open that up. And right now there's no masks because this, so this is out of camera plus an auto tone adjustment and a color adjustment that I did in the basic panel. But now I'm moving over to the masking panel and we wanna talk about doing invert. So the first thing when I look at this, I'm going to say, well, I'd like to adjust the sky. So you can see that this is the opening screen you'll get for the masking panel when you do the very first mask on the image. After that, they change the, for any subsequent mask that you create, they change the way the screen looks. It's got the same information, it just looks different. But on this particular screen, we're gonna do a select sky. So I'm gonna click on that. And you can see right now, the sky has been selected. Now it kind of over selected, if you can see along the perimeter of, uh, along the ridge line there, for some reason that the sky kind of got into the top of the mountains. So, I want to look over here before I get too far into that. And I'm going to, if you look on this panel, I can't open it up anymore. So that's all that there is showing right now, but that should open up. So if I click on it, you will see some details down underneath this. So this is, I don't know the technical term of this, but I call this like the main heading, the main layer mask. And then what comes underneath it, you'll notice the little box is smaller in size than this box is. And I would say these are the selection layers and this is the layer mask itself. So this is sort of the universal one for this particular one, although you can have many, many masks. So there'd be quite a few different layers of mask. So in this case, I did a select mask, excuse me, select sky, so you can see how it writes it down. So it said it was sky one, and it there shows the selection if I hover over it. And then here it says mask one. So when it starts out, it just names it mask one or mask two and so on. And we all should get in the habit of actually detailing the title on these layer masks. And so for this one, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And there's like so many processes in Photoshop and Lightroom, there's more than one way to achieve the same goal. And so to rename this, you can double click on it or you can come over to these three little dots. And if you click on that, the very first one is called rename. So we're gonna do that. And I'm going to show you um, what I'm going to do to the sky. I think I'm going to just turn it really blue. And the only reason is so that 
I'm not doing a real edit on this. I just want to show you what is affected. And I wanted to do something that was pretty bold. And so changing the sky to blue, I'm just going to, um, we'll say a bluer sky. And I hit OK. And so now it's named this layer blue or sky. And so now I can go into my adjustment panel and I could pull it over to a hundred. So let's go ahead and do that. And so now you can see I'm minus a hundred and it's a lot more blue than it was. So here was before and now it's after. And again, I'm not doing this to really do a good edit just to do one that shows what it looks like. Now, when I told you it said it looked like it overlapped here a little bit, and because I did a very strong blue, you can see that the snow is blue and the top edges of these mountains are blue. So I would go in and I would subtract, probably with a brush, and I would make sure my auto mask was on and 100% flow and density, and I could bring my feather down, way down, because it doesn't need to be feathered. I'm going to up my size a little bit. And I would just come in here and paint along this edge in order to get rid of the, the blue that has kind of um, seeped down in there because the mask isn't quite right. So I would clean this up. And because I do have the auto mask on, it's... Uh, might not have gotten all of it because if I didn't click right on the white part, it might have missed it, but okay. So that's pretty decent. So now I wanna show you, this is just not necessarily invert, but just some of the, uh, the workings of the masking panel. So if I now come over here to sky one and I hover over the box, you'll see what was selected with the sky selection. If I hover over the brush, the little box in front of the brush one, you'll see that's where I painted away the blue that was on the mountains. And then if I hover over the one next to where it says bluer skies, we see the accumulation of the selections from below and how it final gives us the final comp composited uh, selection set. So we see what our mask actually looks like. And these are just components of the mask. So I wanted to point that out in case you weren't familiar with that. So now we've selected the sky and it did a pretty good job, but you can go back in and do more correction because I missed this over here. And I just want to say you can continually add. So if I wanted to add or subtract, I could again go in to subtract, get another brush, or I could just simply click back on the brush I had and continue to paint out this area here carefully. So I can correct it somewhat. I'm not gonna make that a pristine selection. Okay, so really what I wanted to do now next would be I'm going to say I wanna work on the foreground. So I need to either create a new mask by clicking this button, or I can go another way. Because I have a sky mask already inside of this mask panel, I've already created it. I can simply go over to these three dots and click on it. And there's two options. One is invert the bluer sky mask layer or duplicate and invert the mask. So there's also more stuff below it, but these are the two we're dealing with tonight. So invert the blue or sky mask. I'm gonna click on it so you can see what happens in case you aren't familiar with it. And this is not what the one I want, but I'm gonna show you what it looks like if you did click on it. So what it did was it actually flipped the mask. So I don't have any more layer masks here. I didn't create a new one. This is the one that I had before. So prior to hitting that invert that mask layer, um, all it did, I had the same coloring. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it flipped the mask. So instead of saying, I want another mask, it just flipped the one I already had. 
and did an invert on that. So it inverted the selection. So it chose this part and it added that blue to it because this was still that same mask. It still has the same adjustment on it, but it's put it down below instead of up in the sky. So that's not what I wanted. So I'm going to do an undo. And so now we're back where we started. So we have the blue in the sky. So let's go to the same three dots, the more, and then I'm going to go to duplicate and invert. And when I do that, now we have the foreground selected. It's different because if you notice the last one, it didn't have the pink overlay showing. It just immediately did the edit to it and it didn't show me the overlay at all. And in this case, I've got my pink overlay. And if I look at that color temperature area, you'll notice it reset it to zero. Mm -hmm. So now I'm free to make any adjustments to the foreground, which is what I wanted to do. And so I could now um, say, well, instead of blue, I'm gonna go wild and I'm gonna just pull it all the way to the right. So it's all yellow, just so you can see what has been selected. Jackie, where's the undo button? Um, I do a command or control Z. You can and also go up what, to HP or Mac. I'm on a Mac. So if, are you on a, what are you on? HP. So you would be, I'm a command a Z. You would be doing a control Z. Okay. Did it work for you? You can also go up to the main menu at the top and in edit, it should, there should be an undo and it also gives you the, I assume the PCs do also give you the formula or the shortcut um, for how to do it. So if you want to undo, it's the command or control Z. Okay. So now we've got our inverted mask and you can see down here, it says blue or sky inverted. You can see that it says that next to the mask. And you can see here's the mask I had prior to doing that duplicate and invert. So indeed, it did take this blue or sky. It inverted it. It titled it by keeping the same name plus adding the word inverted. And so at this point, you probably should rename it. Um, because it would tell me more than blue sky inverted. So in this case, maybe I would double click and I would just say, uh, we'll just say warm foreground. And so now it's been retitled. So you can see I have two layers. And so if we looked at this one, again, just because I did a duplicate and invert doesn't mean I can I have to stop there. So we'll suppose I wanted to take out, oh, say the water. I wanted to exclude that. I could go to subtract, do an object selection, and then I will just draw this really bad looking selection and let it go and it will take it out. And so now my water is back to pre mass of any kind. So if I turn it off and when you watch the water, you can see that the water stayed the same. So anyway, that is a quick way to do that. If you have already created a sky mask, you have to already have the, well, you have to already have created a mask that would work inverted. In other words, the opposite of what you had a mask created of. It could be that you had a picture of a person with a background, you did a portrait of someone and you had a selected person as your initial mask that you made and you had it, and now you wanna work on the background. Well, you can just do an invert of that person and, and it will do the same thing. So it could be that if you wanted to say, select the water and say, the flowers in this picture as your initial one. And you, after that, you said, I want to now do everything else on a new mask. You can use any mask like that as an inverted mask. So that's one way to get from a sky mask, in this case, to an inverted sky mask. But let's um, go back in time here. And I'm going to undo 
all this. I'm going to get rid of it. So I'm going to delete. Well, I wanted to delete the whole thing. We're going to go up to the, if you noticed here, by the way, not what I was supposed to be talking about, but I hit the three dots next to object one and I wanted to delete all my masks, but I couldn't, I could only delete that layer. So if I would have come up to where I wanted to go, which was the main heading for that particular layer mask, and I hit those three buttons at the very bottom, I can delete all the masks, which generally I would never do, <laughs> but in this case it works because we're gonna start over. So now I have no masks, I just deleted them all. So we're back to the beginning. And so if I wanted to create a mask for the foreground. This is back, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, I want to work on the foreground first. Now, what do I select? Well, if you were to select say, well, maybe it's subject because they don't have a, an option for select foreground. You could try that, but it doesn't work. So no subject detected. And you can try background, but again, that didn't work. So where do you go from here, right? So you could get creative and you could try doing an object selection or brushing it all in, but it's much, much easier just to go to sky. And then when it opens up over here, if you look down here, it says select sky and invert. So all I have to do is check mark the box and it is inverted that selection. Now, every one of these options for selections can be inverted. So if something else works better, then you could choose that. So in this case, maybe um, you wanted to, let's come back here and we'll get rid of that real quick and start over. So suppose you wanted to select the water as what you don't want to work on. You want to work on everything globally except that water. So you could go and you could do an object selection. And again, you know, just select in here and let it pick it. Okay, so now you can invert that. So you see select objects and I can click invert if I choose to. And so therefore I can do that. Now you can say, well, okay, but I still don't want to work on the sky, well, that's okay. You can come back up here and do a subtract the sky by doing subtract and select sky. And now you can just work on that part of the um, picture. So you can use invert to shorten your process of doing a selection. And like I said, you can invert any one of these types of selection, whatever works for your picture or your circumstance anyway. Now, is there any, so invert is pretty easy, but you can make it more complex. I will say that when I do an invert, I always invert the bottom layer. So the first one on is, the one at the bottom of the stack is the first layer selection that you have made. And then every one, subsequent one stacks on top. So the one at the top, if I had 10, the 10th, the highest one would be the last one I created. So you wouldn't want to necessarily, if this was your setup, you wouldn't necessarily want to go to sky, the sky selection and do an invert, even though it allow you to do that. But when you do that, you're getting more of kind of um, the intersect type masks that are a different topic. But if I did it, and I will just for demonstration purposes, I'll click on here. It's what it's going to do is it's inverted it, but now it just is going to tell Lightroom, okay, well now I don't want, I want to invert the sky mask. And so it's going to get rid of all the rest. So it's usually, invert is used usually on the lowest level. Invert it first and then remove what you don't want in it, I guess would be the way to phrase that. Is there any question anybody has or any comments about invert and how it works? All right, well, if not, we'll move on to this one. 
This is the one you saw um, last week. And so um, I still have my highlight warning on, which I may turn off. We'll see what I'm going to do here. So what I've done is I've I've gotten back to the edit that I did and I've turned off everything except for what I want you to see at this point in time. I'm gonna turn that off, it's distracting. And so the first one I wanna show you, we're gonna talk about luminous, luminosity mass. And the first one I wanna show you was this tree line and I had started to make it look more frosty. And I noticed that I had missed the upper part of the tree when I made my selection. Why, I don't know, but you can see what I got here. This was the selection that I had, and so I obviously missed the top. Um, but I can correct that. So instead, I could have gone back into this selection and then tried to add to it, but I thought it would just be easier to create a new layer uh, mask. And so here it is, but I've got it turned off. So I'm going to recreate that and walk you through how I did that. So to do it, I kind of talk to myself in my head, I guess. So I walk through the process of what I want to do, or at least that's how I would suggest you start doing it. If you're not real familiar with how these work is if you kind of talk through it in your head or out loud, if you don't have anybody listening to you and you say, okay, in my case, in this, in this situation, I'm going to say, well, I want to take those dark branches and I want to make them lighter, but I don't want to make the light sky background any darker. And if you notice when I said that, I didn't say anything about color or contrast or anything. I just was talking about light versus dark. I wanna make the dark lighter. I don't wanna make the light any darker or any lighter. So how can I do that? Well, if you go up to create a mask, you'll notice that one of the options are luminance range. And that's what luminance is. It's working dark versus light. So we can go into the luminance range and I can select just the dark areas and not worry about the light areas or pull off the light areas out of the selection. So for this situation, because it's pretty much on just a light, all of those branches are on a light background, they're all darker than the background, the luminance range is the perfect tool to help me select those branches. So what I'm gonna do is click on luminance range and it opens the new layer mask and you see new luminance range here, but there's nothing selected or there's nothing yeah, selected or no adjustments made yet. But what we do have at the top and it's always at the top of the panel where you're gonna make your adjustments. So if you're not seeing this bar that says luminance range, it may be somehow you scrolled and tucked it up underneath the, um, panel that shows our mask layers. So I'm gonna make sure that I can see it because this is what I wanna work on. And I'm gonna move my cursor off to the side so you can see it, but I'm talking about this thing. And you'll notice it's totally grayed out or it's black and it's dark. So if you're not familiar with the tool for the luminance range, you might not realize what you need to do next or where to pull, which end to pull from because the whole thing just looks dark. But if you come over to this bar and you click on it, all of a sudden things happen. So you see that the right end of this bar is controlled or is controlling the highlight end. And the uh, left side is the dark end. And my image now has an overlay over the entire picture. So at this point in time, I haven't moved any sliders. My overlay is showing that anything, any adjustments that I make is going to affect the entire picture as a whole. But I don't want to affect the whole picture. Matter of fact, I really just want to affect this. I don't really even care what happens down in here because of what I'm going to do after this step, the next step. Um, so what I'm going to do for you guys to see it better, I'm going to zoom in. Um, that should do it. 
And so what I want to do is I want to keep the dark end because I want to select all the dark branches and I want to not select all the light ends. So I'm going to pull back, pull to the left until I get rid of the white, the light. And if I go beyond this point, I start, you'll notice I'm starting to lose some of the dark areas here. They're just a little, enough lighter that I'm starting to lose them. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. I'm gonna pull this back. And you'll notice as I pulled it back, it's separated. So again, if you're not familiar with this, this is the main area that's being worked on, but there's a fade zone from this arrow to this handle area over here. So I'm gonna pull it back somewhere in here, and then I can tweak and refine my selection with this tool. So I can watch those branches that are up in here and make sure I have them selected. So I'm gonna pull that back to the right a little bit. And I think it's not going all the way to the tips, but I think that'll work okay because they're already a little bit lighter than this stuff was. So I'm gonna stop at about this point and yeah, somewhere in here. And now it's, if I back out, you'll see how much I still have selected down in this lower part of the image. And I don't want any of that. I need to get rid of it. So again, if I'm listening to that little voice in my head, I'm kind of saying, well, I really just want from, a, if I drew a line across about here, I really just want from that line up to stay. And I want to subtract everything from that line down. And so we have the perfect opportunity and tool again. I said it as I was describing to myself what I wanted to do. I wanted to subtract and I wanted to subtract with a straight line going across the whole thing. So I hit subtract and with linear gradient, that's a straight line. So if I subtract a linear gradient from the area I don't want, then it will just leave me with what I do want, which is the top of those trees. So I'm gonna click on it. You'll notice it comes up here. It has the little circle, has a little minus in it to indicate that it was a subtraction as opposed to an addition. And now I'm gonna go over to my image and I, want, I don't wanna come here and draw down. What I wanna do is start at the bottom because that's the part I wanna get rid of. And I wanna click and drag up with my cursor. My cursor's got that crosshair on it. Um, and that's what you get when you draw out uh, a linear gradient. So I'm just gonna click and draw up and you'll see it go away below. And so now I can kind of move this up until I get to the area where I think my divider was. And I didn't draw it out straight, so it's kind of at an angle. So I can, if I would have hit shift, it would have gone up straight. Doesn't really have to be straight anyway, probably because it probably wasn't straight. So we'll we'll try it at that and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I can go up and I can tweak it a little bit. And so now what I want to do is I'm going to show you first off some options that you might be thinking, well, if I wanted to lighten those branches, what exact sliders should I move? And so let's just try a few here at the top. Let's try bringing our exposure up to see if we can lighten the things that are highlighted in pink and see if that works. So I'm gonna pull them up, but I don't necessarily like what it's doing. Personal preference, it's not exactly the look I want. I can zoom in a little bit and that might help. Um, it's not bad, but it's not exactly where I was wanting to go. I didn't move it very far and it started to lose you know, started to not look good. So I'm gonna undo that. And now let's say, well, I could bring up highlights. So let's try that. And again, I don't think it really is accomplishing anything or not much. So that one's out. Um, 
I could try whites because that works on the light stuff. So if I pull that up, you can see what it's doing and not a whole heck of a lot, a little bit, but not a lot. So we have one more option and it's what I did use and it's dehaze. Instead of dehazing, so taking the haze or the that uh, and making it more contrasty, I want to bring it down. So I'm going to pull it down to say, oh, about somewhere in here. And that looks more like what I was going after. So I thought this one, dehaze or rehaze, whichever way you want to say it, did a better job. Now, when I looked at it, I noticed, if you can see right here, it's kind of extra white right through here and right through here. And I thought, what the heck? Why did it do that? Well, I came down here and I clicked on it and I noticed that this mask goes up into that tree on the left and up. So I'm overlapping. So I'm getting two masks working on the same set of branches. So what I can do is go back to the one I was just working on. I could do it on either layer mask actually, but since I'm in this one, I'll go ahead and work it in here. I would say I'm gonna subtract. So I'm gonna I get rid of this a little bit. So I'm gonna also take that out of the selection. So I'm gonna go subtract. I'm gonna pick a brush and I'm going to, I think I'm gonna pull back the flow so I can paint it in slightly. So. If you're not familiar with what flow and density mean, if you wanted to remove, um, or if you wanted to paint something on or off with a brush, and you wanted to say, take away all of what you had put on, maybe you had painted something or made something really dark, you wanted to paint that away somewhere and you wanted to remove it all, if you select 100 on the density, it will take it down to the as though you hadn't put it on to begin with. And then the flow, if it were at 100, would do it all in one stroke. But the flow is how much you're getting per stroke. You don't necessarily have to release the click. It's just the back and forth motion. It will take out 70% each stroke until it gets to a hundred in the density. So flow is taking out at a slower pace instead of all in one stroke, getting to the hundred or whatever your density is. It could be at 50 and say you had your, say you had your um, flow at 43, well, it's gonna take quite a few strokes to even get close to getting to 50% um, or 100 or whatever you happen to have. So anyway, this is just a way of, if you lower your flow, you can maybe feather out the removal in this case a little bit so that it's not a hard line. And so you don't have to be so precise with it. So I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to paint out a little of this at a time. And then I can kind of see, and I'll come over here, and this was where one of the bright spots was. Paint that out. So I'm just trying to match um, what was a little overkill on my part. And that looks pretty decent. Um, So that makes, that looks better in my opinion. So that's how I use luminosity range in order to do that. And it worked really well in this setup because it's almost a black and white image. So it's just darks versus lights. So that was one method. And I'm gonna show you the next one was dealing with the fact that this sky had some blown out areas as did some down in the water. So know that that's coming up, but does anybody have a question or a comment on what I just showed you with this luminosity range mask? No. Nope. Nope. All righty. So, so we'll leave that as is. And now I'm gonna turn out on that highlight warning again. Jackie, I wanna say that for me to understand it, I've gotta use it. So I've gotta go practice that one. 
Yeah, so at least um, we're recording it. So then you can go yeah. in and try it on something you have and maybe go back. You can refer back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, okay, so this one was a way to use a luminosity mask in order to um, get rid of our blown highlights here. And so I'm going to make a new mask. So create a new mask. I'm going to do luminance range again. So I click on that. And again, just like before, you don't see any of the overlay mask yet, and you can't see the light dark area of here. So I'm just going to click on it. And so now again, our whole picture has got the overlay on it. And this time I want to keep the light end of the luminosity range and I want to remove the dark end. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to click on the arrow and I'm going to remove the dark stuff from my mask because I'm really only concerned about the light blown out areas. There's one there, one down here. So I'm going to keep pulling that up and pulling it up and you can see the magenta going away. So my mask is getting more and more specific to an area. And when I get over about this, this area, you can see it's getting closer to where I want to work. The thing is, I haven't got that fade out zone in there, that fade zone. So it's going to be a very abrupt start and stop. So before I show you the fade zone on there, let me show you what it looks like if I didn't have it on there. So we'll just say that, um, I'm gonna just use the exposure slider to demonstrate. So say I wanted to darken that area because it was over a little overexposed and I'm so I'm gonna pull my uh, cursor to the left and you can see that the overexposure is going away, the blown out area, but look what it left me with because it's um, not got that fade zone on there. So with just leaving it as it is, I'm going to go ahead and if you notice if I'm hovering over the arrow, I don't see that little handle and that little handle is what um, I can use sometimes. Now I'm going to keep, I don't really want the little handle to move right now. I want to keep it back there, but I want to move the arrow and you can watch the screen of my picture and you'll notice as I move the arrow to the left, farther away from that handle on that bar, it starts to soften that edge so it's not as sharp a fall off. It also moves my effect farther from the point that I wanted it, but it's softened it so that it works better. And it did get rid of um, the warning, so it did take care of being blown out. However, if I turn the mask off and on, you'll see that the sky gets darker too. So in order to do that, I've also, um, the midtones got darker along with the, the brightest highlights. So to me, um, exposure isn't the way to get rid of it. I worked to show you how I could, um, use that fade zone to my advantage, but it doesn't get rid of our problem in the best way that it could. It's not bad. And if you like uh, the situation where it darkened up the, the top part of the sky, then we may be all set. But for this particular one, I just wanna show you how to get rid of the blown highlights without affecting the, the very top kind of grayer areas at the top of the screen. So I'm going to reset my exposure back to zero by double clicking. And now you can see what this um, mask is actually including. So quite a bit, you know, and I can adjust this if I wanted to um, and decide, you know, maybe down the road with whatever I end up choosing, it may be okay to move my fade zone a little bit where with exposure, it needed to be out farther. But let's continue on with this and we'll see. So again, we saw what exposure did to it and what it took for it to drop the highlights. But probably if I was doing this, my first instinct 
wouldn't necessarily have been to use the exposure slider to get my highlights under control. I probably would have been thinking, oh, I've got to pull my highlight slider down to somewhere lower than what it is. So I'm going to go on negative on the highlights and let's see what it does. Now, because I just created the mask and I haven't done anything, you can't see my highlight warning, but as soon as I click on this arrow, it'll come back. So here you can see the highlight warning. I'm gonna to start to pull down that highlight and it is starting to go down, but look, I'm all the way to minus 100 and I've still got blown highlights. So now what do I do? Well, if you're gonna insist on using the highlight slider, we may have to make a secondary mask in order to get rid of the highlight warnings. But in this case, I don't think that's the best option. It may work, it may not, I didn't try it, um, but that's not what I wanna do. So in my mind, highlight slider isn't going to do the trick. So I'm gonna double click on this and get it back to zero. Let's try whites and see what happens. So if I click here again, you see my highlights. If I start pulling to the left, to the minus side, look at that, it took minus one to get rid of that. So the whites got it under control almost immediately. So it was barely blown out, yet the highlight slider didn't help. And the exposure slider did a lot more than just what I needed. So that white took it down like immediately. So um, there's still a few little bit of red showing up. So I might have to drop it just maybe to three or four to see if I can get rid of those. Got rid of most of them, they're teeny tiny. And if you wonder why it's important to not have an area that's white and blown out, what difference does it make? Because you can't tell, it still looks okay. But if you were ever to print this print, if you have a blown out highlight, it won't get any ink on the print. And it will look, particularly from the side, if it catches the light, there's no print or no ink on the paper in those areas and it doesn't look good. So we always try to keep our highlights from blowing out and the suns are the sun areas are always the tough ones and sometimes they will blow out and you can't retrieve it, but in this case we could and it didn't take very much. So that's how I go about bringing the highlights into control with that. Now I will turn this off one second and I'm going to make a new one. So I use uh, the white slider all the time to do, to and um, to work on my blown highlights if I have some. So what I would normally do, because sometimes luminance the luminance mask doesn't work. You know, this case it did. It was great because the blown out area happened to be in a very light dark situation, but it's not always that easy to separate it with a luminance mask. So if for some reason you have an area blown where the luminance mask doesn't work well, I'm gonna give you another option to try. So we'll go in and we're gonna create a mask and I'm gonna use the brush tool this time. And I want to actually make sure my feather is at zero, my flow is at 100, and my density is at 100, and I wanna make sure auto mask is checked. And I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna make my brush smaller, it's kind of big. And I'm just gonna click inside the red area because if you've got auto mask checked, the way it works is whatever is under your crosshairs, that color or, it will then only select those. So I can click right here and you'll notice the pink, the magenta circle that I got. If I come over here, you still see the magenta circle. And again, once I, <coughs> excuse me, pull the white slider to the left, I always use white, pull it to the left, it just took that one to click it. Now you see that perfect circle, that's where I clicked. So now that I know what it took to do that, I can go ahead and paint 
just where the red is, keeping my cursor, the center, the crosshairs inside. And I can paint away that red and have a nice soft blend. <clears throat> and I can do all of those and be done with it like that. And I could even sweep across here if I start on the red, which sometimes you gotta zoom in to, to hit it exactly. So I'll just leave it at that. But, and that gets rid of the blown highlights in those areas. Now, sometimes if your highlights are blown a lot and you do that, and if I pull that white down too far, again, you get this look. Because what Lightroom tends to do is if it has no information there to re recover or retrieve, it will just turn it gray. So that is not a good substitution for a blown highlight. Just be aware, you don't wanna do that either. So if you have a scenario like this, then what you may have to do is take it into Photoshop, learn Photoshop, take it into Photoshop and actually paint in some, you know, use your clone stamp tool and paint in some information so that there's something in there to work with. But you don't wanna get that look either. So again, what you can do though, is you can paint it in and then pull back until you start getting the red highlight uh, warning coming up and then you know you've gone too far. So you back it off just a little bit farther until it's gone. So that's what I had for you tonight. Is there any question about what I did for blown highlights or any of the, anything else? That was very, very good. And I learned a lot of new tips. Good. Good. Yes. For me, it makes more sense tonight. The other day I was like, huh? And now because I've heard it twice. Um, <laughs> I tried to talk a little slower. And it's such... I to, talk. to me, it's like if somebody's talking too fast, it'll go right over my head. So I thought I knew I had to talk fast the other night to get it all in. And I thought I'm going to try to force myself to talk slower and to not go on some tangent, which I do tend to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's helpful. I'll tell you for me. Yeah. Well, no, good. Very good. Well, it really helped me. I've been using um, some of the masking stuff recently. I've been doing a lot of masking of things and some of the stuff really had me flummoxed, but that really helped. And the lum luminosity I was sort of playing with, but didn't do very well. All right. So I that, tried it out, but yeah. I do Very think good. at least the way my brain works, you know, for me to really almost say out loud what I need to do, you know, oh, okay. I want to increase the contrast in the water. So I need to select the water, you know, so I know what I'm going to do and maybe say out loud it's kind of like when i was doing before like okay it's the dark branches i want from in front of the light high uh, the light sky and it kind of helps me figure out what tool to use inside the mask panel yeah i think that's a good sometimes. yeah when you especially when you get started after you've done it and you say i you, you'll get where it's like oh i know what i used last time and that worked great so i'm going to go in and do that so um, but until you get familiar with it and there's some really nice tools. Oh, I've got, I turned off my share. Um, you know, that we haven't talked about in depth, like I did those, you know, and I do think, um, that intercept tool can be really handy too, which I did use that. Um, I don't know. Do you guys know how to use the intersect? I did do that the other day when I had my. Hold on a second. Is that when you have, they're sort of overlapping, and so you get double dose where they intersect. Yeah. So when I had, so are, can you see this now? My screen. Yeah. Yes. Um. So it was this one. I'll turn this on. Um, this was my mask. Let's see. It started out. Oh, it wasn't this. It wasn't this image. Shoot. It was the the other one that I don't have on right now. But I had drawn a radiant um, like this, and I wanted to subtract the sky, which you could do here. Let me. I'll just 
mess with this. I'll just pull it over here. So now my selection is including the sky and the tree, but if I just wanted it to include the trees and not the sky, I can say, well, I just want to remove it. And there's a couple of ways you can do it, but one of the easiest ways is you can go over here and you can do an intersect. And so you could say, if you wanted the sky, we'll just say you wanted to keep the sky, I, did, I guess I didn't use an intersect on this because it's the opposite of what I wanted. Um, but you could select the sky and it would get rid of the trees. And so now when I hover over, you can see it kept the sky and it got rid of the trees. Here's the exact mass that was left. Um, so yeah, it was the other image that I, I don't have up that I actually used the intersect on. But... Um, need to get it back where it was or it's out of whack I think that's it yeah okay so I thought I was going to show you something but it didn't work but anyway intersect would be is if I um oh let's see say I did an object selection let's see if I can do this correctly I'm not sure that this is in my mind's got it together either <laughs> well it totally eliminated isn't that funny it, it did not it, last time it got everything but the you just never know what's going to happen so if I wanted to add add object <laughs> it's yeah <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it just does it. We'll just do this. Um, so if you said, well, I want to intersect. So I've drawn this mask and now I want to intersect maybe this object with it. I could do that too by saying, okay, let's go over here. We'll do an intersect mask with an object and then just do this. And then it would remove whatever you don't want to use. And it leads us back. So intersect could be done, you know, different ways and achieve the same goal. But that intersect can work pretty handy in some more intricate situations than this. Um, I would need to find a better example to really show you uh, what it can do. But so I don't I don't think I'm ready for intersect. So thank you. Very much. <laughs> yeah, and I just probably should not have gone there because it actually probably created more questions than it did <laughs> did good. So I'll just get out of that. Um, <laughs> but that is a fun one to use if the situation warrants it. Okay. Thanks, Jackie. Oh, sure. that's great. Yeah. Okay, I, I just stopped the recording. I do have one question. Um, should we stop?